Wonderful. Hi, welcome everybody. I am super honored to give this talk. Thank you so much for giving me an hour of your valuable time. And uh, we're going to jump right in about the rise of AI under the lens of sustainability. Now, you may wonder who am I to talk about this? We'll keep this part super brief. I'm certified, said some universities. So we'll just skip that part and talk about the topics that I'm really passionate about and that I hope I can get you a little bit passionate about today and tie those into AI. So um, the first one is sustainability transformation. Um, I really care about our environment and preserving our planet. I almost walked away from completing my PhD for working for an environmental organization. But then I decided I already had put 10 years into this topic. So I should probably finish that and maybe see if I can make use of that for doing something for sustainability. So about 10 years ago, I shifted my research towards how can we use software engineering to make human lifestyle a little more sustainable. And that usually starts in requirements engineering, which is where we start identifying the requirements and the goals for the systems that we're going to develop. And that was the area where I did my PhD. And over the next few years, I co-developed the sustainability awareness framework with a group of international researchers, which I'm going to present to you um, a, in a very brief manner today. And then something that I have discovered more recently and dedicated myself to more recently are neuroplasticity practices. So it's one very specific aspect of sustainability, like the sustainability and well-being of an individual human, which is also related to their creativity and productivity. And neuroplasticity practices sounds very fancy, but this is based on my 20 years of practice and um, five years of teaching of yoga and meditation and breath work. So you may wonder, what does AI support, like, what, what does that have to do with all of that? But it actually ties into all of these aspects. And we did a study in 2018 that uh, looked into the sustainability impacts of specific AI technologies and what we could do with those in practice. But first, I'll give you a tiny little foundation in sustainability, a little bit of background. So... One of my favorite people in this area is John Ehrenfeld. He's an emeritus at MIT, and he wrote quite a few books about sustainability, and he coined my favorite definition of it. You may be familiar with the Brundtland definition that talked about sustainable development as opposed to just sustainability and defined the triple bottom line for it. But Ehrenfeld said, well, sustainability, yes, that's an end, um, and we should understand it as the ability to flourish indefinitely. So that means he sees that once we get to something that we may want to call sustainability, that means we as humanity, we get to flourish. We will be living in peace and in collaboration and equitable and all on good terms with each other. Now he says the main problem with this and with getting there is currently most of our approaches focus on reducing unsustainability. So if you, for example, think about energy efficiency, that's great. Hopefully, when we have more energy efficient devices, we're going to save energy if people actually stick with their usage as opposed to now using the technology more than before, because that rebound effect can easily happen. Um, another example of reducing unsustainability uh, would be we can now buy these emission certificates. So if I'm a company and I know I blast out a lot of, um, of emissions in the air, perfect. I can buy that certificate and have these wonderful people over there in Finland buy, um, grow a bunch of large forests. Cool. Now my conscience is clear and I can continue to blast dirt in the air. Not really it the idea of it. It's like, there were good ideas at the bottom, but the way how we're currently implementing them 
it's reducing unsustainability. It's not yet really creating sustainability. Okay, that's why the flower has a sad face. So what to do next? And I looked into anthropology. I looked into Joseph Tainter's work. He's been working on, um, actually he started with the collapse of societies back in the 90s. And then he started looking into, well, what if things don't collapse? What if we can turn them around? What does that mean if we want to talk about sustainability? And he said there are four important questions that we have to ask if we want to look into the sustainability of a system. So Joseph Tainter is, like I said, an anthropologist, so he does not necessarily talk about software systems or software intensive systems. He comes from a completely different background, but in a conversation at UC Irvine in California a few years ago, we talked about how we could apply that same framework to software intensive systems. So he said, first thing we have to talk about is what are we trying to sustain? Like what's the system purpose or the mission behind that system? And then he asks, well, for whom do we want to sustain this system? Who are the stakeholders? Can we actually really talk to all of them? And then for how long do we want to sustain this system? For a decade? For a generation? For three? That's pretty short. Like, if you ask most software development companies, they look a few years ahead in the future. If you ask the old Native American tribes how they take their decisions, they ask themselves, how does my decision today impact seven generations into the future? And if we want to think about maintaining this planet long term, that's maybe a better timeline to go by. And then the fourth question is, at what cost? What is the return on investment that we need to get to? What is the environmental cost? And what is the social impact of maintaining the system? So there I was in 2014 with that framework trying to bring that into software engineering. Hmm. Took a big cup of coffee, a very big cup of coffee, an American-sized cup of coffee. I said, all right, it begins with requirements engineering. Um, so how do we infuse this into how we develop a software system? And I took our artifact-based requirements engineering process at the time that worked with a stakeholder model a, a sustainable business model. And then we derive the objectives and goals from that. And based on these objectives and goals, we would develop a system vision and then a usage model and a sustainability analysis. So far, so good. I think we've heard these terms before. Okay, stakeholders, people we need to talk to, business model, so that this is somehow gonna um, make some money in the future so we can pay the developers who develop the system. And there should be some objectives in some way that should improve the world. And then we develop a vision. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we look into the sustainability of that system vision and of the, those objectives? Well, that means we have to understand what the different dimensions of sustainability even are. Like, how do I understand whether a system is sustainable? And this is where I would like to ask you, what um, would you consider are the dimensions of sustainability? This is where we have that um, first Mentimeter question in there. Um, so we can either use that or we could just pop it in the chat because the audience is not that large. <laughs> so as you wish. Uh, uh, put it in, in Mentimeter uh, gives okay. a better uh, documentation possibility. Okay, let's do that then. So, Matthias, yeah, thank you. Uh, you see the chat, uh, there's a, a share link to the Menti. Perfect. So, here we go. Um, what would you consider a dimension or an aspect for sustainability? Let me know. And then let's let's take a look at the results. Oh, sweet! Right. There's my talk. 
There <laughs> is in the bottom there. Yeah, you see it. Okay. Durable resource utilization. And then we have energy, society, cohesion, preservation of diverse wildlife. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So the resource utilization. Perfect. That's like a technical aspect of it. And then we have energy. We have society. Um, cohesion, I would relate also to the technical aspect and then preservation of diverse wildlife, some part of the environmental dimension. So that does include the aspects that um, we have in our model here. We have a technical model, uh, sorry, a technical dimension. We have an economic dimension, an env environmental one, a social one, and an individual one. Now, there are some that um, we pay attention to more than others, like traditionally in software engineering, technical, kind of taken care of. There is a lot of good people working on maintainability of systems, evolvability of systems, economics. Companies tend to take good care of that because otherwise they wouldn't, they would go out of business. But then when we come to the environmental and the social and the individual dimension, that's where so far the support has been a little less. Individual is the ability of a human to maintain themselves over the course of their lifetime. And then social is the ability of a group to do so and to have people live together in a sustainable way, um, in an equitable way. And environmental means that we don't cause negative environmental impacts that we manage to preserve wildlife, that we manage to preserve natural environments. And now the question is, well, that's kind of neat and dandy. We have those five dimensions, but really what do software systems have to do with those five dimensions? I'm like, yeah, we said something about earning money and we do see the technical relevance and the connection, but the environmental above energy efficiency, how does that really connect? So that's where we get to the work of Lorenz Hildi and Bernd Ebischer, who looked into the effects of and by ICT. And they said, we can always see ICT as part of the problem or ICT as part of the solution. And when it's part of the problem, we have the life cycle of ICT and we will know how much resources we use during production, use of the system and during end of life disposal. And then we have enabling effects and the enabling effects talk about what happens when a user interacts with that system. So we have induction effects and we have obsolescence effects as problems. Induction effects means now I use more stuff than before and obsolescence effects means I also create more waste than before. And we see that by the amount of abandoned devices that we may find in some dark drawers in the corner um, or in, I don't know, in some back room in the office. Um, it could also be positive. So we also have substitution effects and optimization effects. So when years ago we used to buy a lot of hardware to, for example, play music, now we cannot just stream that and optimization goes in the same way. So we can say, we are today saving a lot of travel costs because I didn't have to get on a train to come all the way to your university. I am just giving this talk from my home office. And then we also see systemic effects. So on the negative side, we have rebound effects. That is what I mentioned earlier. Now that things are more energy efficient, oh, all of a sudden we have several devices where we just used to have one because they're so small and efficient and they're not so expensive anymore. And we have emerging risks that come with that, like the amount of toxins that we're exposed to, for example, in um, our home environments, but also on a global scale by all the e-waste that we pulled out. And on the systemic effects positive side, we can see how we could support a transition towards sustainable patterns of production and consumption. Good, so now we got the next puzzle piece. Now we have an idea of how this connects to ICT. 
But now, if I'm going to develop a new system, how could I possibly foresee any of that? Like what those effects are really going to be? That's what we developed the sustainability analysis framework for that comes with a sustainability analysis diagram. That's a central component, a central artifact that gives you a little overview of what might be going on. And yes, there are tiny thumbnails on the bottom and we'll zoom into those on the next slide. So what the purpose of this diagram is, is it wants you to give an overview. It wants to give you an overview of what um, does, for example, environmental sustainability mean for the system that we're currently thinking about developing or about evolving? Could be greenfield, could be something that we already have in place. And it visualizes both the five dimensions, which you will see on um, the pie pieces, so to speak, of that radar chart. And we have the orders of impact from inside to the outside, the direct, indirect, and systemic effects, the immediate enabling and structural effects. So let's look into one of those examples. Here we have a little procurement system that um, has those five dimensions on the outside. And then we have the direct effects, indirect effects, and structural effects. So we can see that uh, on an individual level, the procurement system that has as a purpose, we're going to try and recommend more environmentally sustainable products to the people who need to purchase their things through this procurement system. So a procurement system is what you use in a company. When you have to purchase items, you need to run that through the procurement system. So it's kind of a restriction as opposed to you as an employee just going off and buying what you think is best. You have to run it through the company's official system. And that way you can have policies in place like we will try to do that with local suppliers. We will try to have uh, a low carbon footprint in here for the um, products that you can purchase. And then that can have a positive impact on the carbon footprint in my local community, as well as in strengthening the local economy here as a third order effect. And a second example for this type of diagram um, is the smart resilient gardens example that we developed. So this is something that I worked with at Cal State Long Beach. And um, we actually deployed this out in the university gardens. So the purpose of the system was to look into how can we grow vegetables in Southern California with as little water as possible while still making sure that they can grow well. And so we said, okay, user ha users have an initial investment here on the economic side. Um, but then we can contribute to sustainable food production and that can increase local sustainable food production and could potentially help um, in community gardens across the city. And that can also increase people's health when they get more familiar with the food that they consume. And there are studies that show if you eat home cooked meals, that's, that's the number one indicator across all medical studies for long-term health. So remember that when you go home tonight, cook your own food, number one health indicator. <laughs> so um, I know there's a lot of effects on this diagram and I don't uh, expect you at all to look at all of those and to try and soak all of those in. The point of this diagram is it gives you one overview of all the effects that are likely to happen, the positive ones and the negative ones, um, when we put a certain system into place. And therefore, it serves a discussion as a discussion basis of where we want to set our emphasis in developing a product. So we could, for example, say, huh, okay, if... Um, this can help citizens to grow community gardens on a systemic level. Maybe that means that early on we can already get ties to the local communities and to the city and see if we can find some support for getting this deployed in community gardens. And um, on the environmental side, well, maybe we can find some sponsors that want to use this on a wider, um, in a wider network of school gardens and therefore see 
if we can educate our educate our kids earlier on with school gardens about um, growing food locally and resilient. Especially with the pandemic this year, we've seen how important local food production is once uh, global supply chains get disrupted a little bit. And therefore, it's a topic that has become, well, let's say a little bit more center stage again about how can we make sure that as local communities, we also have a certain resilience and are not too dependent on long supply chains that come from all around the globe. Now, that was a lot on sustainability. Wasn't this seminar on AI? Yep, we're getting there. So this was my little background on the technique because that framework we're gonna use to look at the different aspects of artificial intelligence. We're gonna use the lens of this sustainability analysis framework. So in the study that we did in 2018, um, we, went a little ways back and said, well, okay, this has been around since the 1950s. And now we just have a bunch of new techniques and we have a bunch of faster hardware that enables us to do this a lot more efficiently. It's being hyped a lot. By the way, don't use that in the papers that you write. Um, people don't like the word hype because it's a pejorative term. I just read that in a review yesterday. Um, but I'm allowed to use it in a presentation because AI has been pushed in a lot of funding schemes. And so we thought in 2018, well, maybe it's time to check how sustainable this is. And so we looked into a lot of literature, including popular science and gray literature. So we, we said we want to make sure that we look into what's currently going on because in part, our publication uh, cycles are pretty long. And maybe we find more interesting stuff if we also look into popular science. And then we're going to run this analysis on the five dimensions and the three orders of impact and see what we can find there. Turned out it was not that easy to differentiate the three orders of impact. So we kind of discarded that along the way. And instead, we said, let's just look at those five dimensions to make it a little easier. So we found a lot of interesting literature that showed us many different application domains for artificial intelligence. So in the social area, you could find a lot of potential support for legal frameworks. We can look into fraud detection. We can look into connection between people and their interactions. We can look at liability concerns. This is something that Locally here in Gothenburg is very interesting because we work a lot with automotive concerns. And as soon as we talk about uh, autonomous driving, they get very interested in the liability perspective. We can look at organizational structures and maybe a reverse trend to outsourcing. Wait, if I can develop more on an automatic basis, then probably I have to outsource a little less. Could be. Um, there are some topics around digital storytelling and also around trustworthiness. When we look into the individual dimension, we've seen a lot of work around emotional well being that we'll pick up again later in the discussion of this talk. There are nursing robots for elderly care. There's a lot of support in health using uh, sensor networks. Mm, there's also a lot of privacy concerns in the individual domain we can potentially improve our work efficiency a lot using AI, and we can also use it for education. Now, me being a university professor, I don't know if I'm so excited about the prospect of being replaced by a robot, but you know, maybe in five years, this talk will be given by a robot, and that's okay. Then I'll be off doing some other stuff. Um, in the environmental dimension, there is a lot that AI can help us with for knowledge management because we have giant amounts of data with all the sensors that we've deployed around the world to learn more about nature. But then the big challenge is how do we now make sense of this giant amount of data? Um, another piece is planned obsolescence. How can AI help us take better care of that um, and reduce pollution and better do our waste management? 
On the downside, we also do see a lot of increase of gadgets. In the technical dimension, we found interesting work around ethics and engineering ethics in specific. Um, on a technical level, there's also a lot about deep learning. And then um, here we have the coders being replaced by AI. So there's AI coding AI. We found some projects on that. Uh, there is work on visual object detection and a lot of work around responsibility. So I'll get back to that responsibility piece in just a little bit. Mm. Actually, let's do that right now. Um, second Mentimeter question, please, was about a robot that causes an environmental disaster. And if that happens, what are we going to do with that? Can we get the second question, please? Uh, yeah, uh, everyone who did the first question will just have to uh, look at their screen and it's there. Same link? Yeah. Mm. Uh, if you Let's submit, uh, if you, well, oh, um, I didn't submit yeah. anything. right. <laughs> Yes. So who's responsible when a robot causes an environmental disaster? And I'm very conscious that I didn't give you much context here. So let's say there is a robot in a manufacturing plant uh, and responsible for putting together some systems, uh, some, some product. And for some reason, there is something wrong with the robot and uh, there is a leakage and some toxic stuff gets into the groundwater. So what happens? Who's going to be responsible here? Is it going to be the developers? Is it going to be the company? Is it going to be the manufacturers of the robot? Is it going to be the state that allowed people to use the robot? Like, what are your thoughts on this? Oops, didn't want to get to the Third question yet, so let's see. Oh, we had some more dimensions for sustainability here that were submitted a tad later. I like the happiness dimension. I definitely wanna include the happiness dimension in my framework. I think it's part of the individual dimension. So thank you for that. Work-life balance goes in that same direction and biodiversity, yes. Um, good, so how do I get to yeah, here we go. Beautiful, thank you for your answers. So when a robot causes an environmental disaster, okay, could be the developers, could be the owner, the producer, mm -hmm. the driver of the robot, yeah, whoever is kind of driving the robot or um, telling it what to do, software engineers, the AI training data engineer, yep, the company, depends on the contract between the robot development company or the company who uses the robot and the very classic consultant answer it depends on the context yes so yes absolutely it's not going to be that easy that we can very clearly say without the very specific context what do we do and depends on the contract very spot on because such a robot would never be in place without there being an exact liability contract. And so this little example just um, goes to show how many different aspects are involved in as we try to bring AI into play and what, uh, what are the things we'll, we'll have to take into account when we uh, um, deploy these techniques. So the main findings that we had, just summarizing up um, kind of the breadth of topics that we came across is that on an economic level, AI is already a major industry and um, it can possibly displace some low skilled workers. And we maybe see that a lot this year right now as many people have lost their jobs um, for a different reason, not for AI suddenly taking over, but um, there's a lot of 
jobs that have been taken out of the market um, have been reduced as much as possible and um, AI could potentially have another wave of that coming up and the question is what are we going to do with all the people who are losing their jobs essentially because they're again being taken away by machines and it's not the first time that we uh, are facing this dilemma we've had that a lot with manufacturing plants in the past where there are already um, robots in place taking care of these tasks that used to be filled by human workers. And we're getting to a new level of complexity of where that is possible that we'll have to deal with on a societal level again. On the technical level with um, the advancement, AI could learn and teach how to code even itself. And that may cause a lot of disruption in the IT industry itself. On an environmental level, we can see that AI may impact waste and pollution management. It could negatively impact sustainability because of high resource consumption. But there are positive aspects as well, like it could help us better understand and manage and analyze the giant amounts of observational data that we have about nature right now. And then on an individual level, um, it could impact work, but it could also empower users uh, with agency. And we can find positive applications for interactions in education, in nursing, and also to battle social isolation, which has been a big topic this year. And on a societal level, AI can take a role in assisting us in community. It can manage social media to some extent. Sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes that's not a great thing at all because sometimes it feels like a lot of what we get fed now is run through algorithms that we don't feel we're in control over because we don't understand very well what's going on. And it can definitely help us automate uh, routine tasks that are commonly outsourced. It may also be able to participate in digital storytelling. And we'll get back to that part of storytelling in a little while. Now, that concludes, there's good and bad scenarios. <laughs> okay, that part in itself, not surprising. It's a tool, AI is a technology with many different aspects that can, that can help us and that can um, also hmm, lead to some serious problems. And let's look into a couple of those concerns and into some interesting work that's going on around there. So, Brady Booch said, every line of code represents an ethical and moral implication. And that is something that has stuck with me ever since he said that in 2015 at a conference in Florence. Um, so we have a lot of concerns around ethics and transparency, around privacy. There's been work that's showing us that there is a lot of bias in systems. One of the really beautiful examples in work in this area was done by Latanya Sweeney. She has exposed a lot of racial discrimination in online advertising. So for example, she found that 25% of displayed ads suggested that there was a criminal past when uh, you would enter a typical black name. So you enter a typical black name in a search engine and the ads that get displayed next to the search engine results would suggest um, that some kind of criminal past had happened, like bond agencies and stuff would show up, like how to bail somebody out. Um, and that is pretty strong racial discrimination. Mm. So she's at the Harvard's Data Privacy Lab. Um, at University of California, Berkeley, Don Song is a professor who has been looking a lot into how can we build a responsible data economy. And she ran a summit called Responsible AI, uh, Responsible Data. And uh, she also has a Slack workspace, um, responsibledataai.slack.com that you can join if that is a topic of, of interest to you. I find the conversations highly interesting there. A little more in the area of individual um, sustainability is work that uh, Sushi Saria has been doing. She's an assistant professor at John Hopkins. 
and uh, she has been working a lot with large data sensor platforms and electronic medical records. So she says there is a tremendous opportunity for high impact work because as soon as you go further into the rural areas, we have very little medical care possibilities. And so if we can get remote sensor platforms, if we can get better data connectivity, if we can get some basic information infrastructure in place where people can upload data and um, where we can get expert opinions from AI or expert advice or expert suggestions on what to check for, then that can sufficiently facilitate medical work in very rural remote areas. Now, when we think about this year, there have been some large scale medical concerns. One of them is the COVID-19 virus, that pandemic, why many of us have been working from home for most of the years, why there have been lockdown and lo lockdowns in a lot of places. But what's the other part? The other part of the health concerns is the results from all that isol uh, social isolation. So this year we've seen a tremendous increase in um, mental struggles and emotional struggles. People have been very isolated, the ones who are living by themselves. Um, people who do not live by themselves, they may be in emotional turmoil because all of a sudden they are together 24 seven in a very tight um, space with yes, their loved ones. And we also know our loved ones are the ones who know how to push our buttons the very best. So anything that has ever been, let's say a potential point of disturbance in our personal life, this year has certainly come to the extreme one way or another, either because sometimes every once in a while you've felt lonely, that's been taken to the extreme this year, or maybe sometimes every once in a while things got too much and too close and that's been taken to the extreme this year. So we've seen tremendous amounts of distress and also obviously because of a lot of lost jobs. Now, what does that mean when we take it back to AI? When we know that there is a lot of emotional and mental health problems going on, Yuval Harari was the one who said, well, I don't think we need to be afraid of AI starting kind of a robot war against us. It's not so much about the assassin robots. Maybe we should be more concerned about hordes of little bots like on social media that know really well how to press our emotional buttons better than our mother. And I think we've seen that a lot this year Maybe, for example, during the US presidential election, don't know whether you followed that, but there has been a lot of um, emotional campaigns running through social media and a lot of, well, not so truths out there um, and trying to fact check the other side, but essentially it often comes back to working with the emotions of people as opposed to relying purely on facts. And so that is something that we've seen in the work with AI a lot recently. And there is a couple of professors who've been working with that as well. I wanna introduce three of them to you. Number one is Kate Darling. Um, she has the nickname Mistress of Machines. She's given a really good TED talk on why we have an emotional connection to robots. And uh, she examines the emotional connections that form between people and the machines. She also wrote a book called The New Breed that investigates that in a little more detail. And she essentially starts with explaining very simply like that robot that she has sitting uh, on the table next to herself. It has kind of facial features and that is enough for us to connect with it. And it doesn't really have to be an AI robot. I mean that... We already know that from when there is a teddy bear that a kid really loves. Then um, the fact that this teddy bear has kind of a face makes it more connectable, more relatable. And then we spend a lot of time with it. And that's what you could potentially do with a robot that is designed for social interaction and for companionship. And then you would certainly develop an emotional relationship with that machine. Another 
academic that has looked into well I, I don't even know if I want to call her an academic because she's not um, in academia anymore she decided actually to to start her own company both of the uh, women on this slide uh, Rana El Kalyubi she has worked a lot with how uh, robots can learn to recognize emotions better and she predicts that three to five years from now our devices will be emotion aware and that it won't be surprising to us any longer like right now when I talk to say the voice on my phone which I'm not very good at but then um, that voice on my phone that intelligence on my phone doesn't know the um, uh, the mood that I'm in, but a couple of years down the road, she very mel well may. And uh, Rana also wrote a book, Girl Decoded, that goes into a little more detail about that. Um, and then Carol Riley, the um, last example that I want to point out in this row, she uh, founded a couple of companies. So she founded Tinkerbell Labs, which was uh, on low-cost do-it-yourself open source projects uh, especially in robotics and then squishy bots which are educational robotics for children and um, in she also was one of the main developers of drive.ai um, and she noticed within the silicon valley industry there is a big compassion program and she says, well, not only in Silicon Valley, but she says all the major AI schools, the light schools um, in the US and in other countries uh, where the founders of a lot of the big tech companies come from and the new startups that work a lot with AI, they want to become the next billion dollar companies and don't necessarily have the ethical foundation because not all the schools teach that. So she says the ethical side and intellectual side have to be balanced or else we're going to start seeing bigger problems as we go into the fourth industrial revolution. Now, depending, and this is where it gets really interesting for the next 15 minutes, <laughs> depending on the exact topic of research that you're working with right now, I'm really curious to learn a little bit about that and to, I want to encourage you to imagine a little bit what the science fiction of that would be. Now, let me put science fiction into a bit, bit of a better context. Mm, there is something called design fiction and design fiction wants to go five or 10 years down the road look a little bit into science fiction and say, hey, what um, could be a contribution that we will be making to science not too long down the road? So how can science fiction be a purposeful, deliberate and direct participant in the practices of science fact, science fact as opposed to science fiction? And we wrote a paper on um, design fiction a couple of years ago for the International Conference on ICT for Sustainability and looked into what could be the systems 15 years down the road that we might be able to research and what would be a potential abstract for that. And we came up with a number of really interesting ideas. We were soliciting submissions by the community and then gave a summary presentation at the conference. And so what I would love to explore with you today is how will your AI research contribute to a more sustainable society and way of life on this planet? And that is where I'm just going to give you a brief glimpse into where my design fiction goes. And then I want you to think about what could be the potential headline for a paper that you're going to write in five or 10 years about the AI research that you've been doing. So when I look at this for my topic of interest, the neuroplasticity practices, then my big why is I see a lot of people in my environment stressed out. I see my students stressed out. I see my colleagues stressed out. I see um, my industry partners being stressed out. 
there's always another paper deadline. There's always another project deadline. There's always a feeling we are behind in getting our to-do list done. Um, plus on top, our mind has an evolutionary negativity bias, which is not very helpful <laughs> for staying a happy person all day long. And um, there is always a notion of competitiveness to get somewhere in industry, to achieve enough um, and to innovate enough and to kind of make it on your way. So I've been running a breathing practices study that is just wrapping up this week. We had the last live session last week and I'm finally collecting the surveys and that we're gonna run again starting in January where we collect data on if you follow certain breathing practices a couple of times a week, does that help to lower your perceived stress over time? Does that increase your mental and emotional well-being? Does that help with your perceived productivity? And um, what other benefits may we possibly find here? Can that possibly help us make better decisions because we get more in touch with our intuition as we become more relaxed, we have better access to our inner knowing. And I am right now writing a paper around that where I interviewed a number of experts on intuitive decision-making based on embodiment techniques that, for example, include these breathing practices. So my headline for five years down the future would be three times these breathing practices per week and our AI will help predict which decisions you're gonna be better at. Just putting that out there. So you can follow those links if you're interested in more details on that work. But for the discussion part of this, for the rest of our time together here, I am really curious about that third question that we put on Menti, which is, Invent, ah, we're back at the first one, because um, I opened a new window, my bad. Invent a headline of a paper you'd like to write on how your AI research contributes to a more sustainable society. So I just gave you my little example, and I'm very curious what you're going to be doing. And this is where I wanna use that as a transition into our discussion. So I'm, I'm curious about how your personal interest ties in with this, where you could see that heading in the future. And I'm also open to discuss any questions that you may have. David, may I ask a very simple question? Yes. Can you make your slides available to? Absolutely, yes, of course. Thank you. So let's see. Oh, gotta use the other one to get back to the results. Let's see, that looks exciting. Um, AI determines, AI de determines your happiness and fear levels and causes and provides you a sustainable inner peace. Yes. So we're gonna have our little, our little coach for inner balance right there. I like that one. A peer-to-peer -peer approach to reliable detection of misinformation. Yes, yes, good one. Mm -hmm. So what's gonna help us to, to better, as Steve Easterbrook phrased this a couple of years ago in a course that he gave, how to detect crap on the internet. <laughs> so Steve Easterbrook is teaching, a, I think it's a master's level course at the University of Toronto that's called how to detect crap on the internet. Um, or I think it was actually a module, not an entire course. Then third one, AI designs a new material that is stronger than steel with no environmental costs. Yes, please. So here we go into 
substitution and zero cost to the environment, that would be fun, phenomenal. Your ecological footprint, new application will guide your daily decisions. Okay, yes. So an AI that would support us in making more environmentally sustainable choices. And then student learning helper bots that reduce stress for students in higher education, a trajectory of case studies. Oh yeah, I like that. The helper bots that would reduce stress. Very cool. I love all five of those ideas. I would love to read those. Will you send me the papers once you've written them, please? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So let's see. I am curious in, I'm curious on your thoughts on these topics here. If you have additional thoughts or comments on that. And otherwise I'm also open and happy to, to take questions. Yeah, thank you Birgit for this very inspiring talk, I would like to open the, the round for comments and questions. So please just unmute your microphone and uh, use the opportunity to talk to Birgit about this topic. Maybe to, to start um, in, in, in your chart about the, the sustainability, sustainability dimensions, there seem to be more positive goals uh, rather than potential risks. So um, is that by design or? Um, um. I wouldn't say by design. I would say um, we provided an overview of a lot of research topics that were going on at the time. And there may be, sorry, were you referring this one or were yes. you referring to, okay. Um, yeah, so I would say these are the topic areas. These are not necessarily the, the final impact. It's almost like for each of those topics, we can find a couple of subtopics that then have positive and negative impacts. Because mm -hmm. we could see, um, for example, the emotional well being here on the very left. We could see how AI could be a support in. I have my little meditation robot next to me that reminds me, like that um, the learning helper bot that appeared in one of the, in one of the fictional titles. That could be a positive one. Or we could say, wait, 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 AI is now running my life. I'm, I'm not doing emotionally well at all. So it could be deterring as well. And I think that's the case for quite a few of those topics. So if we go to the very far other side on the ethics, maybe we could also see how in a big knowledge management system, AI could help us find the way through Yet at the same time, we also see there's a lot of ethical problems with AI deciding something for us because we have to implement it one way or another. So I guess this is just the overview figure as opposed to giving you the actual list of positive and negative effects. Thank you for the question. Good, more questions, please, please speak up. Hello, Sara, Yusuf, uh, were running a seminar earlier a few weeks ago. Uh, did you get any ideas from that uh, seminar, Sara, that um, came to mind uh, during this talk? Well, thank you, Johanny, for putting me in the spot suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were talking about AI and the future of AI. Where will AI take us? It is now not a field by itself. 
Now it is in every field and uh, bioinformatics and business and mm -hmm. everywhere. Like you cannot say AI stands by itself. Mm -hmm. um, I love the angle that you put it from the social part, so from society. Um, I like this, so I mentioned this happiness angle, this inner peace angle. So I think we've been focusing a lot on the technical side mm -hmm. and we forgot that the user will be a human. And we usually say technology makes our life easier. It makes our, yeah, it saves us time, but somehow mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah. Yeah, so it's currently putting more anxiety on us. Like people are addicted to Facebook, how to make Facebook, how to make people addicted to social media, how to make people using the technology more. And I like the point that you mentioned um that people are trying to be the next billionaire without this ethical angle so i think it is important to to put this side in uh, education in courses whether it was well i don't believe it should be a separate course it should be a part of uh, mm -hmm. the technical courses mm -hmm how to look like, for example, in algorithms, it's not just an algorithm of computational algorithm, it should be also how this algorithm affects the, the users. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I fully agree. I, I think you're raising a couple of really good points here. Um, it, is, it is a really good observation that, um, technology tends to put more anxiety on us when initially we invented it to take away our work. So all, all the industrial development that we've been doing was to make our life easier, to have to work less. Now, we are not doing the very same type of work anymore, but we're not working less in terms of hours. In fact, we, we somehow tend to, to do more work because now it's higher level and more complex work. But we haven't really gotten around to thinking about, hey, what does that look like if technology is now doing a lot of the work that we used to do? How do we reorganize ourselves as a society? It's almost like we seem to be losing some part of our meaning of our purpose when we can't put all our effort into working anymore. It's like wait, what, what, what do I do now? We see that a lot with people who retire, who used to be very purpose-driven and very much tied and passionate about their job. They, they are kind of, they, they need to reorient for a while and say, okay, what do I want to dedicate myself to now? And, um, and that in itself is okay, because we can always reorient. We can always pivot and find a new thing. Um, but I, I find it a very interesting aspect to not develop technology for the technology's sake and to keep ourselves in the illusion of, oh, we're always going to become more efficient. That's also, okay, we'll become more efficient. And what for? What are we going to do instead? <laughs> and how can we make sure that we don't invent technology for technology's sake? Like, we don't do it just because we can. A former colleague of mine, Six Silberman, he wrote a really cool paper called when the implication is not to design. So bringing up a few cases where it was like, yeah, we could invent a system for that, but is that really gonna shift something? Is that really gonna be bring a benefit? And, and the other aspect of this is how can we make sure that we develop technology for the human and not just another piece of technology that the human has to adapt itself to? So we see a lot that we are more adapting to the technology than the technology to us. So lots of interesting points in there. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. And if no one is jumping, I would also mention like a mini article that I, log in, uh, I wrote in my blog that I believe AI should take our jobs, not for the sake that, okay, we will go and sleep, but I believe that AI should take our job and the message of AI taking someone's job or machines in general or technology taking a job um, of the lower level, it's a message to say, level up. Mm -hmm. Say humanity, level up. It's 
no longer this routine job that a human should do. The human should develop their uh, thinking, there should, they should develop their creativity, mm -hmm. leave these routine jobs for the AI, for the robots, for the machine, for the technology, and level up your, your thinking. Yes, yes, exactly. So like, what's the next stage after this? Okay, this part is taken care of now by the machines. So human, what are you going to apply yourself to? <laughs> what's your purpose? <laughs> and where else can you contribute? Very nice. Um, would, would you put the link to your blog in the chat? I would love to read it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would be happy. I'm just thinking of some, some science fiction movies where robots develop uh, yeah, their own identity and self-consciousness. And they realize that the problem uh, with sustainability are humans. So they take over the strategic decision-making and um, yeah, may that be um, one of the possible futures that the strategic decision-making is taken away from, from humans. Mm -hmm. Potentially. <laughs> I couldn't blame them. <laughs> the, um... So many years ago, I was at a conference actually in Passau on operation research, and there was an invited talk from a US researcher on artificial intelligence looking into the future at that time. And uh, he said, okay, soon we will have robots for cleaning our, our households. So these, um, we now have these uh, vacuum cleaners that uh, vacuum cleaner robots. And that, that was what, what he was thinking about. And then not in a distant future, the robots will ask for the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. So we should look forward for uh, robots who demand uh, a say in the uh, society. Um, yeah, I was a bit uh, confused and disturbed at that time, uh, but um, yeah, now, now we are maybe closer to this. So what was his point for saying that it would be good if the robots had the right to vote? Yeah, that was provocative. Uh, mm -hmm. so he was one of the um, AI researchers who thought that everything is good with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. it, it's a good thing that um, AI programs develop um, uh, intelligence uh, mm -hmm. comparable to human intelligence. And then, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sign of success if they demand the right to vote sign of success for the AI uh, researchers. Mm -hmm. I think my main concern would be that whoever programmed that AI now has more influence in voting because now they are multiplying themselves. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Maybe a technical question to Matthias or Gunnar. Yes. Um, the slides, how could they be distributed? Uh, to which email address? Um, I'm thinking maybe we can distribute it with the IPC newsletter. Oh, yeah. If that's uh, okay with Birgit. Uh, yeah, and also feel so... free to put them on the very same website where you okay. advertise the talk. Yeah, if sure. those can be publicly oh. available. Yeah. Can I share your link that you provided us with for the presentation, maybe in the chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. So that's because I have it on my screen, so you can get it right away. That's great. Good. More questions? Comments? Or you have a question to ask, Birgit? I am really curious what topics you're working on. So there, are, there have to be a couple of people here working on AI topics if that's the topic of this PhD seminar. So yeah, maybe yeah, cooking. 
Sara uh, and Arthur Thaleo and Eric Yu. Could you talk about your PC project? Okay, I wanted to leave it for the seniors to start. Maybe Ilya and Eric. Um, hello, it's Eric. Um, so I'm working more about with them. Um, um, well, so human robot interaction, but come from a kind of cognitive science perspective mm -hmm. and try to have a. Um, um, well, I, I like the fairly basic research aspects. Um, so I'm not necessarily that deep into AI specifically, but um, try to understand both, well, partly try to understand intelligence in all its forms, so to speak. But um, I'm also, well, I'm not super impressed with AI compared to kind of biological intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, with the uh, voting robots, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I don't think that. Um, I mean, you could have robots demanding the right to vote since the fifties. It's easy to just, you know, run a script that will print, uh, give me the right to vote. Correct. Um, Good point. And I don't think we have come very far since then in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. So giving the robots the right to vote would be to give uh, more votes to the programmer or whoever the programmer is working for, etc. cetera. Um, so AI and robots are still, I don't know, fairly basic machines in that sense. So there, there are kind of um, complex, um, They can take several inputs and do complex things, and then some output comes out. But there's there's still far from what we see in biology. Um, but it's easy to be kind of tricked by them um, because they they look um, uh, biological, for example. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not valid. Uh, so, for example, if you find support or comfort in a robot. Then that comfort can still be real, uh, but um, just because of that, you shouldn't uh, assume that. I mean, because I can find comfort in the robot, uh, that robot can also um, do all other things that a human can do. So you need to be careful what, how you kind of, um, um, what conclusions you draw. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> I. I I think I'm ramping a bit, um, but I enjoyed the talk very much. And I think it's very um, important to um, make sure to focus on the kind of sustainability issues um, and the ethical issues uh, with regard to AI and robotics, um, because those are the important questions. And as you mentioned before, things like, um, uh, I mean, what's the point of a robot and what's the point of AI, those are kind of the main questions to ask. So um, the robots taking our jobs is a good thing, but um, because then we free up time for us to do meaningful things. Um, but uh, the AI can't decide what is meaningful. Um, maybe for themselves, if they are good at that, but that's their, <laughs> their issue to speak. But yeah, so sorry for ranting and thank you for <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was a rant at all, or at least I very much appreciate the ranting part because it um, makes me very confident in, <laughs> in, in that we're still pursuing the right paths. I'm very wary about um, AI enthusiasts that don't seem to apply enough um, critical thinking to it. So I, I very much appreciate all your thoughts on this and, and as well the, um, the meaning finding component that we want to dedicate ourselves more to. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi. So, hi. Uh, I'm Elio, the, the other guy they mentioned. Uh, and I'm also a PhD student and uh, close to the end, I guess. I'm looking into visual analytics. Well, that's the field in general, but I'm looking into 
looking at cluster patterns in, in very large data sets. And there's a bit of machine learning in it uh, to model distributions and densities in, in the data set. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it's very interesting uh, what uh, Eric was saying about this. Uh, well, uh, he didn't say hype, but uh, thinking that machines are actually mimicking uh, human behavior. I guess it's a <laughs> very philosophical kind of question, right? Uh, will we ever know if that happens at some point in time? So how do we draw the line uh, between the, the artificial and the biological? I don't know. Uh, so well, in my, in my uh, research field, there's a, a boom in, the, in this, uh, what they call interpretable machine learning or explainable machine learning. So there's a lot of publications happening. And hopefully they, they shed some light on, on understanding what it is that the machine is doing and what it's uh, producing, right? So that it's, uh, it's not so shady. Uh, it's not, yeah, we take away this uh, magical part of it, I guess, or, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, in general, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, to be honest, I uh, still haven't managed to train myself to focus on one thing when I'm just looking at the computer, so I go on and off. <laughs> so I'll be coming back to your presentation again. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this uh, digital uh, presentation story uh, can be tricky, at least for me sometimes. Thank you. Thanks for your contribution. Also, I appreciate the honesty. It's actually something that I'm that I'm digging into in my research as well because um, you know all this this multitasking stuff. It's an illusion. Like we know that it's an illusion because we can only do one thing well at a time. I mean, I may be able to talk on the phone and and stir a pot without burning the food that's in it. That's about it. <laughs> and so anything that tries to go beyond that. Um, we just got to keep ourselves in check, whether that means I'm now going to be on my standing desk and I'm going to do my, I don't know, my, my biceps curls while listening to a talk. That might be a feasible thing. <laughs> Answering emails while listening to the talk, eh, it's not going to go down well. <laughs> so I think that's another very interesting um, ha, research topic. There we go. Procrastination research. Procrastination research is what I label everything that's interesting, but that I'm not supposed to do right now. <laughs> and so um, I believe that there can be a combination of, of tasks that is feasible that will help us engage a little more. And this is maybe a homework for everybody on this call who is teaching. Like, how do we make sure that we can keep our students engaged while we have to teach online? <laughs> but it's the same thing in the classroom. As soon as we have people sitting behind the laptop, we don't know so exactly what we're doing or what they are doing, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. My research topic is, so I belong to the same group with Eric. We also see about this uh, cognitive science aspects and my uh, research projects. I'm also a PhD in my midway. Uh, my research topic is how to bring uh, techniques from the um, like bio-inspired cognitive techniques into AI. So how to model, to model new techniques in AI based on or inspired from these uh, biological uh, aspects or biocognition. And my thought behind it is that as developer and as scientist, we develop ourselves in the AI. So mm -hmm. I believe like, for example, a life coach would develop an AI different than a mathematician. So I try to bring myself or to bring some of my, how I see my cognition into AI and how we do this uh, decision making, especially for autonomous systems that runs um, like systems that run in real life. So I work with uh, self-driving cars. So this high input dimension space how can it work autonomously? Uh, unlike the closed environment robots, so when it is a closed environment robot, you can control it, you can control the environment, you have deterministic cases, but when it is in real life, it is in open 
wildlife, then it is we have all the possibilities. So how can we uh, get inspired from the biological uh, cognition into AI? So this is what I'm working on. Cool. You said something that I find super, super important, and that's the um, we embed our values into the systems that we design. Like, I think we've written that in several papers. Um, we, we not as in, I'm speaking of myself in the majestic plural, but like the people that I work with in my international group. Um, we have written that in, in the Kolskrona Manifesto on Sustainability Design. And um, since then developed that line of saying, well, that's also why we have the responsibility for the systems that we developed. And that's why we need to look into the sustainability impacts that these systems will have in the future. So I think what you're doing there is super valuable work, right on. Good. Good, I think, ah, uh, Ilio. <laughs> yeah, I had one final thought thinking about this, uh, the, the, this about the systems being very close to being biological or not. I was wondering if the, to what extent does it matter if people perceive it as such even if they're not, right? If people perceive things to be behaving in a biological manner or, yeah, they will be treated as such somehow, at least by some people. Yeah. Good thought. Yeah, I think yes, it's an interesting one to ponder upon. You're kind of giving us the thinking homework for tonight, I would say, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Good. So I um, I like to thank you again, uh, Birgit, um, for this uh, inspiring, I must say, uh, presentation. Even though you are not far away, we do it uh, online. I hope um, we return to also face-to-face -face, uh, seminars and, and meetings in in the future, where um, yeah, this discussion can be continued. So thank you again, and uh, yeah, please send me the uh, the link to the slides or the slides, and maybe your, the link to your YouTube channel. Yes, that absolutely. Can, uh, distribute that. Okay. So, thank you very thanks much. Again. Thanks for having me. Thank thanks for attending. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening. <laughs> Same.